Okay, so we're gonna be speaking about uh, maximizing the taper in aquatics, and this is all the ground that I want to cover. So that's quite a bit of ground to cover, and uh, I'm gonna be going a little bit fast. Do I get some extra time because of the F up? Good, thank you. So the first thing is what is a taper? Then we are going to look at the effects on, uh, of tapering on performance by way of a meta-analysis. I'm going to talk about body composition and nutrient intake during the taper environmental factors that might affect the taper, individual adaptation profiles, innovative tapering strategies, and then a summary of optimal tapering strategies. So the first point is, what is a taper? What, what are we talking about when we talk about the taper? And this is one of the multiple definitions that you can find in the literature. A taper is the training phase characterized by a reduction of the amount of training that athletes undergo during the final days leading to a major competition. So we train and we train and we train, but when we really want to optimize performance, we are saying that we should reduce the training load. What is the aim of reducing the training load at the last minute? This is something that I wrote in 1998, and excuse me for reading it, but I think it's important. The goal during the taper periods is to maintain the physiological adaptations achieved during intensive training while the negative impact of training resolves. Under ideal circumstances, this will result in an athlete who has made maximal physiological adjustments. At the exact same time, the negative influences of training have diminished, resulting in an optimal performance potential. So we are saying that when you train hard, you get fit, but you also accumulate fatigue. And only when that fatigue dissipates, you are going to be able to see the uh, positive impact of training. So the main point is that we should try to maintain the adaptations. This is something that I wrote 11 years later based on the evidence that we had 11 years later. The performance enhancement that usually takes place with the taper is related to recovery of physiological capacities that were impaired by past training and to the restoration of the tolerance to training resulting in further adaptations during the taper. So we are no longer saying that we should simply maintain the adaptations that we already have. We are saying that we recover the capacity to train, to adapt, and then we can get additional adaptations that are going to make us faster in the pool. So where does all this come from? A lot of what we know about the taper comes from the application of mathematical modeling and systems theory to the world of sports. When we do this application, and this is a model by, uh, by a Canadian physiologist, Eric Bannister, that passed away four or five years ago, uh, we assume that the athlete is the system. And this system has an input, which is training, and it has an output, which is performance. And in the middle, there is a black box of responses. Some of them are positive, fitness, and some of them are negative, accumulated fatigue. And these two adaptations are summarized by uh, transfer functions, mathematical transfer functions. So the sum of those two antagonistic transfer functions is going to give us the output of the system. A modified way to express this is by way of influence curves based on uh, Selly's um, theory of adaptation. Every athlete has an initial level of performance. When we apply a training load, so every athlete has an initial level of performance, we apply a training load, and the first thing that happens is that performance drops, then there is a phase of recovery, and until that point, we can say that this particular training is having a negative influence on performance. Then from this point on, ideally there will be a phase of supercompensation, and then we can say that this particular training starts having a positive influence on performance. This section of the negative influence is a curve, and this section is also a curve. And curves can be described by way of mathematical functions. So if we find the way to describe the shape of the curve for each particular athlete, we know at each point in time where the negative influence is, that is accumulated fatigue, and where the positive influence is, that is the level of fitness. So what we are trying to do is characterize a dynamical process. And in order to do that, we need to do basically two things. The first one is quantify the input. We need quantification of training. And then we need to quantify the output. We need to assess repeatedly the performance level of the athlete. That is represented by the white dots. The blue line is the mathematical function that gives us the best possible fit with the real data. 
when the adjustment between real data and the mathematical function is good enough, we can go back to the black box in the middle and using the um, reference uh, models that are given by Bannister and by, Bu by Busso, we can assess where fitness is and where fatigue is at each point in time. What you see here is the application of that mat uh, mathematical model to one particular swimmer. At the bottom, you see the quantification of training throughout an entire season. On the top, the white line represents the evolution of performance, real performance of the athlete throughout the year. The orange line on top is the best possible fit of modeled performance with real performance. And as you can see, that fit is pretty good, is statistically valid, and in that case, we can go to the black box in the middle, and we can look at the red line, which is the negative influence throughout the entire season, and the blue line, which is the positive influence or fitness level throughout the entire season. Obviously, the best performances are going to take place when the difference between the positive influence and the negative influence is maximal. That is here, that is here, and that is here too. So when we applied this mathematical model to 18 elite swimmers, we could assess the effects of tapering on the positive influence and the negative influence. What you see there is the level of um, fitness in the early season, when they have been training for one week, and then before and after taper one, taper two, and taper three. And what we saw was that the taper did not induce significant changes in the level of fitness. So why was performance improving? Basically because we were achieving very significant drops in the negative influence during the taper. That is, we were eliminating accumulated fatigue more than we were increasing the fitness levels of the athletes. But what does that mean uh, in terms of physiology? It means that if you succeed with your taper, you might achieve an increased VO2 max, an improvement of movement economy, muscle oxygenation, you might increase testosterone concentration, red cell volume, hematocrit, hemoglobin, reticulocytes, glycogen concentration, oxidative enzymes, muscle fiber contractile properties, strength, and power. A successful taper might do all or some of these things. And from a psychological point of view, you will reduce your perception of effort, your global mood disturbance measured by the POMS scale is going to decrease, your perception of fatigue is going to decrease, you are going to have an increased perception of vigor, and the quality of sleep might improve as well. So what kind of uh, training manipulations should we do in order to optimize the effects of the taper? We assessed this by way of a meta-analysis with French and Canadian colleagues a few years ago. The first question is, what happens if we reduce the training load by reducing training intensity? And as you can see there, if you do reduce the training intensity in red, the effect on performance is not going to be significant. In fact, it's very close to zero, minus 0 0.02. And the value in parentheses shows the 95% confidence interval. So some athletes are going to go faster, some athletes are going to go slower. If you want to play safe, do not reduce the training intensity because the effect is highly significant and the 95% confidence interval is in the positive side, meaning that all or most of your athletes are going to benefit for, uh, from that strategy. Training intensity is key if we want to optimize performance. The second way we can manipulate the training load is by reducing the training volume. And in this case, we had enough, enough data in the literature to go beyond reduce training volume, yes or no. We could assess what happens if you reduce training volume by 20% or less. In comparison to the pre-taper mesocycle, 21 to 40%, 41 to 60 or 61 or more. And as you can see there, if you wanna play safe, if you wanna have real chances of uh, getting your taper right, go for a reduction of 41 to 60%. That's where the point of performance improvement is highest, and that is where the 95% confidence interval remains in the positive area. You can reduce by more than that, but 
you have the risk, and now I run out of battery, no, you have the risk of reducing by too much and some athletes might actually lose adaptation and detrain. The third training um, variable that we can manipulate is training frequency. And in this case, we could only assess the effects of reducing it, yes or no. If you do reduce training frequency, the effect is not quite significant, and there is a risk of some athletes not improving, as shown by the 95% confidence interval. So if you wanna play safe, do not reduce training frequency. The effect is very significant, and the 95% confidence interval remains positive. We can also manipulate the duration of the taper. How long before the main competition we start reducing the training load? And we had enough data to uh, evaluate the effects of tapers lasting between one and four weeks. Your best bet would be to go for a two-week taper. That's when we get the highest mean improvement and that's where we get a 95% confidence interval that remains above zero. Of course, you can go beyond that to three weeks and four weeks and still, on average, get a performance improvement. But as you can see, the, um, the range gets much higher. For some athletes, it's a really good strategy, but for some athletes, it might be too long, training too little. We will see later what uh, it depends on um, in terms of duration of, of training. Then you can also manipulate the shape of the taper because if you look at the scientific literature, there are different concepts of taper. Some people speak about tapering and they are saying, okay, from tomorrow on, we are going to train 30% of what we were training until now for two weeks. Or you can reduce linearly. Or you can reduce uh, exponentially with a slow decay or exponentially with a fast decay. The problem with these different strategies is that none of them have the same area under the curve. So it's very difficult to design a study in which you only manipulate the shape of the taper without actually changing the total amount of training that the athletes undertake. So with the meta-analysis, so all we could do was compare a step taper so a sudden standardized reduction of the training load and a progressive taper that includes both the linear and the exponential reduction. And what we can say is that the safe bet is to go for a progressive taper. That's where we get a significant gain and that's where the 95% confidence interval is on the positive side. But mind you, you might use a step taper and on average, you are going to get a pretty good response. This meta-analysis includes studies done in different types of locomotion, but we also run the meta-analysis for swimming, for running, and for cycling. And the swimming characteristics are exactly those that I uh, talked about for the overall uh, data set. So what type of performance improvement can we expect from an efficient taper? The magic number seems to be 3% or around 3%. That's the mean improvement we will get from a performance immediately before the taper and then after the taper with a range that is usually between 0.5 and 6%. And those numbers have been observed in swimming, in running, in cycling, triathlon, rowing, lifting, and even in team sports in any kind of physical performance that we can measure, such, such as um, uh, counter movement jump, acceleration, deceleration, sprinting ability, etc. In 2000, we were very fortunate that there was a Grand Prix in Melbourne three weeks before the games in Sydney. And 99 swimmers participated in the same event in Melbourne, and then three weeks later in Sydney. So basically we could consider the difference between performance in Melbourne and performance in Sydney as the difference in performance uh, as a result of the taper. We saw that there was a difference in, uh, in terms of sex with men improving a little bit more between Melbourne and Sydney than women. This was a purely observational study so that we could not determine whether it was due to different nutrition, uh, different swimming suit, or uh, whatever. 
maybe it might, it, it might have to do with the fact that women are usually um, shaved all year, whereas men usually shave only for the major competition. So they might get a bigger improvement in performance um, for the big competition. No difference in event distance. So you can expect the same amount of improvement from a 50 meter swimmer, from a 100 meter swimmer, or for a 400 meter swimmer. No difference between stroke. You see here that the values between freestyle and form are almost identical for men and almost identical uh, for women. No difference in terms of uh, swimmer caliber. So the swimmers that won medals improved as much as the swimmers that made it to the final but did not win medals, and they improved as much as those who only reached the semifinal and as much as those who only swam the qualifying heats. But, and this is a very important point, the impact of the taper on competition placing can be huge. Look at this, this is the mean performance improvement during the taper. And this is the, perform the percentage difference in performance between winning gold in Sydney 2000 and finishing fourth. In every single swimming event of the Olympic program. And this is the difference between winning bronze and finishing eighth, finishing last in the final. And as you can see, the taper, the mean performance improvement that you can achieve during the taper is bigger than the difference between gold and fourth and the difference between bronze and eighth. That means that if you get your taper right and everyone else doesn't, that might take you from not, from not winning a medal to being an Olympic champion or from finishing last in the final to winning the bronze medal. This is an aspect that is often uh, overlooked, body composition and nutrient intake. There are two studies at least available in the literature, one of them on long distance triathletes, in which they quantified the energy intake before the taper, during intensive training, and then during the taper. And the interesting point is that these athletes were having an energy intake that was identical during intensive training and during the taper whereas energy expenditure decreased from 17 megajoules to 12 megajoules a day. What is gonna happen? Obviously, these athletes are going to increase their body mass and their percentage, or maybe if they don't increase their body mass, they are going to increase their percentage body fat at the worst possible time. Same finding in endurance runners. So the main recommendation that we usually give athletes is when you are tapering for competition, pay careful attention to matching energy intake in accordance with the reduced energy expenditure that characterizes this training period. So basically, they have to eat less. Do they have to change what they put in their plates? The answer seems to be no, because the respiratory exchange, exchange ratio that gives us an idea of the percentage contribution of carbohydrate and fat to energy provision does not change during the taper. So unless you are trying to achieve uh, glycogen uh, supercompensation, for example, there is no need to manipulate the content of your diet. But you should use a smaller plate because a lot of athletes are used to seeing a given amount of food in their plate. It's very difficult for them to conceive that they need to manipulate the amount of food depending on how much they are training. So to make sure that they reduce their energy intake, just use smaller plates. And be very careful with iron stores. If you start the taper with uh, limited iron stores, there is a risk that because you might increase your erythropoietic activity during the taper, you might finish the taper in an iron deficiency status. So make sure that when you get to the taper, there is enough iron in the system. It might not affect your immediate performance, but it might affect the following training block if it's not the end of the season. Environmental factors that might affect uh, the taper, we all know that um, environmental stressors like travel across time zones, heat and altitude might interfere with the taper of athletes when they are preparing for international competition. 
What do we tell athletes when they have to face jet lag? We tell them to reduce the training load until their body adapts to the new time zone. So that reduction should be integrated into the taper program. Tapering in hot environments before competition seems to be compatible with the reduction in training volume recommended when we face heat stress. And finally, altitude training camps also require an initial reduction in training load, which might in itself constitute a form of tapering. I'm not saying that we should consider that because you are reducing the training load to adapt to the heat or to adapt to altitude, you are already tapering. I'm just saying that these factors need to be integrated when you design your tapering program. This is very, very important. Individual adaptation profiles are going to determine the type of taper and the duration of the taper that should be optimal for each athlete. These are two real examples of the application of the mathematical model that I have shown before to two real athletes. Same age, same distance, same performance level. This is the graph that corresponds to Cecile, and this is the graph that corresponds to LN. Obviously, these two athletes cannot do the same taper. Cecile recovers very quickly, but she also loses adaptation very quickly. So if she does a taper that is too long, she's going to detrain. Helen can afford to do a longer taper because she needs longer to recover, and the risk of her losing adaptation is very small because she has a long duration positive influence. So with Helen, we can do a very slow, very progressive, very long taper because we don't risk losing fitness. And this is the typical athlete that is good for the main event, and then she has to get back into consistent, solid training. Whereas this other girl can afford to perform and perform two weeks later and perform at the next Grand Prix and, the ne and perform at the next uh, World Cup because she has a long duration positive influence of training. And that is going to determine how you design your taper. And in fact, when we did this, we had 18 different tapering strategies for each one of our um, swimmers. Once you have applied the mathematical model for your athletes, you know what's in the black box. You know what the fitness formula is for your athlete and what the fatigue formula is for your athlete. So you can do a prediction of the system's behavior based on previous observation. If you remember, initially we had the question mark not here but in the middle. But once you know what's in the middle, you can say, if I manipulate training knowing the model parameters, what will be the outcome? Or you can say, what type of training do I have to do knowing what's in the black box to achieve a particular performance? And that's what we did with the data that we had from the swimmers I've been talking about. In the first study, we wanted to know what would have happened to the ideal taper and to performance if we had increased the training load by 20% for four weeks immediately before the taper. So you overreach the athletes for four weeks by increasing the real training load by 20%. What happens to the taper? Basically what happens is that you do not have to change the percentage reduction, but you have to do a longer taper because you have increased the level of fatigue of the athlete. Do you optimize performance by doing that? Yes, you do, according to the mathematical model. So basically, if you increase your training load by 20% during 28 days before the taper, this requires a training reduction of around 65% over three weeks, and you are going to improve your performance further than if you do not overreach the athlete. That is the prediction of the model. In the second uh, simulation, what we did was ask ourselves what would happen if we increase the training load towards the end of the taper when the athlete is fresh. So the athlete recovers, now they are able to undertake uh, heavier training loads to achieve further adaptation. 
would that give us an additional performance benefit? And the answer from this simulation was yes. Uh, if you increase the training load by about 30% in the final three days of the taper, you may achieve a significant additional gain in performance. But the main point of this study was that, hey, why don't we try new things? Because even if you do a step taper or a linear taper or an exponential taper, it's only one phase. You reduce. What if we try innovative tapering strategies? We may achieve additional performance benefits. So to summarize the optimal tapering strategies that um, we have seen uh, in the scientific literature, we could say that the main aim of the taper is to minimize fatigue and improve performance by improving fitness, maintain training intensity, reduce training volume by 41 to 60%, maintain training frequency at at least 80% of the usual training frequency. This is particularly important in very technical sports in which the athlete needs to maintain the feel, in this case, the feel for the water. Individualized taper duration between a very wide range, four days, 28 days, depending on the individual profile of adaptation, depending on the level of fatigue, and depending also on the importance of the competition. Apparently, progressive nonlinear tapering designs are more effective and do not expect miracles. The taper works, but it doesn't work miracles. So we know how much we could improve with an efficient taper, about 3%. So don't give your athletes unrealistic uh, expectations. If they are swimming 60 seconds in 100 uh, breasts, don't tell them, oh, don't worry, in two weeks you're gonna swim 52. No, they're gonna swim 58.2 to 59.3. That is a realistic performance expectation. I showed this book uh, yesterday because I invited elite personalities, athletes and coaches from different sports to contribute to it. And there is one contribution on swimming and it's uh, by Bob Bowman. And this is the, uh, the, the key messages from Bob's uh, contribution. Each athlete's specific characteristics should be kept in mind when designing a long, medium, and short-term training and picking plan. Keep in consideration the specificities of the event and the mental preparation of the athletes. Keep things in perspective no matter how a swimmer feels day to day. That means have faith in the plan despite temporary setbacks. Do not panic because one day, four days before the competition, the athlete doesn't feel good. If the program has been good and you have faith in your program, just, hey, tomorrow will be another day and things might be a little bit better. And the taper should not be a completely different training phase than what you have been doing until then. The taper should be a natural outgrowth of the entire training year. And that is a mistake that some coaches make. Tomorrow we start tapering and tomorrow we start doing something that is completely different, that is completely new, and that is simply going to switch the stress of volume for the stress of intensity. And therefore there is no recovery. And that is the main aim of the taper, to eliminate accumulated fatigue. Thank you for your attention.